gather here as your saints and your children. We pray, Lord, that we can open up your word with honest hearts and we pray that we'll take the things that we study and give every opportunity and every diligence to study with others, that others will have the opportunity to know your word and that they will be willing to study your word further and take the opportunity to obey you before it's too late. Lord, we thank you for every blessing that you give us. We pray that you'll continue to bless us as you see fit. We pray that you'll be with those that are unable to be with us this morning. We pray that you'll watch over them and care for them. Lord, we ask that you will forgive us of our sins at this time, that we might stand before your throne justified. Lord, we thank you for your son, Jesus, and it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Brother Chris, could you turn to... Acts chapter 17 and verse 30. And um, Steve, could you turn to Revelation, or sorry, Acts 26 and verse 20 for us and read those. And we'll get uh, Chris's first and then Steve's. So, Acts 17 and 30. Yes, please. So, before you read that, a um, little bit of context here in Acts chapter 17, we have. Paul on Mars Hill, he's preaching to the Greeks, he's walked through this whole line of statues of false gods, most of us know this chapter, and he gets to this one that they have with the inscription of the unknown God, and Paul has preached to them about this unknown God being God, of, that we know of as God the Father, the Heavenly Father, the one God that is the Godhead that created all things and now speaking of the Old Testament and idol worship, we have Acts 17 verse 30. And the time of the age of God was that the mouth of men and all men everywhere to repent. All men everywhere to repent. Repentance is to turn away from sin. If he wants us to turn away from sin, We've talked in a lesson before, there's an absence, there's a void. If we're turning away from something, he wants us to turn to something. And that's where we pick up in 26 and verse 20. See? But declared first to those in Damascus and in Jerusalem, and throughout all the region of Judea, and then to the Gentiles, that they should repent, turn to God, and do works benefiting in their kingdom. He wants us to repent, turn away from sin, and turn to God. So that emptiness, that void of sin, is to be filled with God. We turn to God when we repent. Um, we've talked before how repentance is, get our geometry turns out here, with a 180 degree turn. We turn away from sin, living that life of sin, and we turn our back on sin and turn to God. Revelation 3 verse 19 says, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. See, God loves us. He's going to chasten us. A lot of people don't think of it that way. Um, but God loves us, so he is going to rebuke us. He is going to chasten us. Hebrews 12 and verse 6, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth, scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. See, if we truly are the sons of God, we are going to be chastened. We're going to be rebuked. Um, just like our own children, if we truly love our own children, we're going to rebuke them. We're going to correct them because we love them. We want them to live right lives. We want them to live correctly, not only in our sight, but in the sight of the whole world. Um, just like I've said before, and you've probably said this to your own children, Anytime my mom did drop me off at school, she didn't have to do it very much because I rode the bus, but anytime she dropped me off at school, she said, now don't forget who you represent. She represented, or I represented my parents, I represented my grandparents, um, we represent a lot of people around us. And as the children of God, we represent God, we represent the church. And anytime we go out into the world, we need to remember that. And that has to do with how we live our lives. Now, before we become Christians, we have to repent. And 
that's what we're talking about here in this lesson, is repentance. So repentance implies that one has done something wrong. Well. And this is why the writer of this um, pamphlet or commentary here says it is the hardest or most difficult command is because if it was easy, more people would have done it already. Um, we could argue all day long about what the most difficult command is, but obviously it is difficult or more, more people would have done it. Um, how many in here, you don't have to raise your hand, but think about it, how many in here like to be told that you're wrong? We don't like it, do we? Yeah. I don't like to be told when I'm wrong. We don't like to admit when we're wrong. But it's pride. It's a pride thing. Yeah. Um, but pride goeth before the fall. Before destruction. Thank you. Thank you for correcting me. Um, and so we have to be able to admit that we're wrong. Because if we don't repent, we cannot be saved. Um, and just like we read in Acts 17 verse 30 um, it is a command we have to do it so there's three requirements that have to be learned repentance is a change of mind it, pro it is produced by godly sorrow we're going to read 2 Corinthians 7 here in just a little bit and it results in a reformation or a change of life so it's not just a change of mind but it results in a change of life. It requires the three things that we talked about last week in that Bible heart. The intellect will first have to think about that change of mind. It requires an emotion and will. So the intellect to realize that we've sinned against God, the emotion to want to do something about it and truly feel in our hearts that it was wrong, our sin, and then feel the need to change and then actually will to go about to do it. Um, remember that um, free will. We have the free will to do it, but the will to change our lives to correct it. So, Renato, could you get 2 Corinthians chapter 7 verses 9 and 10 for us, please? Now want to please God. 
So it's a long-term change, and it's a godly sorrow that works towards salvation, results in salvation. So it's two different types of sorrow. It's two different types of repentance. And the true godly sorrow, the true, true repentance, is something that's lifelong. It's not just something we do short term. Matthew chapter 7, verses 16 through 20, Jesus says, by their fruits, ye shall know them. So, this isn't something that we just have to go around professing lifelong. Hey, I repented. You don't have to tell everybody I repented. Our actions will prove it. Um, we've all heard the phrase, actions speak louder than words. Sarah used to tell me that a lot. In fact, she's probably said it recently, and I may just not remember. But um, actions speak louder than words. And we need to let people know in our lives that we have repented, that we believe in God through our actions. We don't have to tell people we've repented. Our fruits will bear it out. Bring forth fruit, meat for repentance. Next, he says three reasons to consider repentance. We don't need to go back and look at it, but we've read before Luke 14, 26 through 33. This is where Jesus talks about uh, how we need to weigh the costs, uh, count the costs, about building a tower or going off to war. Before you build a tower, you're going to make sure you've got all the money for it, right? Because if you don't, you get halfway through the tower and you run out of money. Or before you go off to war, you get through the war, you don't have enough money to feed your troops, or you don't have enough money for armor. You didn't count the cost. And this is the same thing before we obey the gospel, we have to count the cost. Now, Jesus paid the ultimate cost, but before we obey the gospel, we have to think, we got to give up the old life of sin? Are we ready to do that? We have to realize that there's work to be done. Are we ready to do that? We have to count the cost. So the three reasons to consider, the first one he says is one should repent foremost to be saved from our sins. Acts, 17, or Acts 2 and verse 38, when Peter was preaching on the day of Pentecost, um, that's what baptism is for, for the forgiveness of sins. But he says repent and be baptized. So we have to repent. He also says no accountable person has ever been or will ever be saved without repenting. True is that. Again, we have to be able to admit that we were wrong in the first place. If we don't do that, we can't be saved. We have to turn away from our sins. Second, he says one should repent to enjoy abundant and abundant life now. Hebrews 11 and verse 25, the pleasures of sin last for how long? A season, right? But the consequences last for how long? And eternity, right? If we don't repent in this lifetime. But Jesus, let's uh, let's go to John 10 and verse 10. Sarah, could you get that one for us, please? I'm sorry. John 10 and verse 10. Jesus tells us a little bit different thing when we live a life with Jesus. We're serving Jesus. serving Jesus in this lifetime, we can have life more abundantly. And if we continue to serve him faithfully, then we're going to have it more eternally in heaven. The third one is one should repent to restore purpose and usefulness to life. He talks about this uh, ring that was fallen. Uh, this is a whole chemistry thing. Uh, but when we sin, our spirit changes form. And when we obey the gospel, then uh, we are restored by the blood of Jesus into the form, Colossians 3 and verse 10, or the image of God. Uh, the blood of Christ can renew our image 
is God. And so we need to have our purpose restored, our image restored, and our usefulness restored after we have gone into this life of sin. And that's what obeying the gospel, that's what repenting can do for us. But as we know, repentance is not enough. We have to fulfill completely the gospel that goes into confession and baptism, which we'll get to later on. Any questions or comments at this point before we move on? Okay. Next is three obstacles to overcome. So here we have the devil throwing out barriers or obstacles. So the first one is ignorance. And as we all know, ignorance does not mean someone is stupid. That's a word I don't like to use in my classroom. I don't let my students use that. It just means someone is lacking knowledge. We, we know that. So uh, Satan throws out this barrier. Some do not repent because they're unaware. They lack knowledge that they're sinners. They just don't know. So people try to compare themselves with others that are around them. They might ask the question, am I as good as others? I changed the question a little bit than what he put on here. Am I as good as others? Am I just as good as everyone else? Or am I a little better than that person? When they should be asking, am I a sinner? So um, when I put this in educational terms, um, my students always try to compare themselves to the other students around me. And we should never do that. In growth of knowledge, we should compare ourselves always to ourselves first and foremost. Or to Christ. Or to Christ, right. Um, we should be growing in knowledge of what we know, and if we're going to get better, it should be what we're studying and not what somebody else is studying. Um, we should be studying more of and growing from our own personal perspective and not what somebody else is studying. Paul oh, yeah, well, that's 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 10 12. It says, For we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with the, with some that commend themselves, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves is not wise. Right. We're always going to be smarter than somebody. We're always going to study the Bible longer. We're only going to be as weak or strong as we apply ourselves. And so we should study where, where we're at and don't worry about comparing ourselves to others. But we do need to grow. That's the main focus. And so when someone is coming to the knowledge of the truth, the first question they should ask is, am I a sinner? Second is, obviously they know they are. Or they should know they are, because all have sinned, Romans 3.23, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So the next question is, have I been forgiven? What can I do about it? Um, and so the answer is, obey the gospel. And the, the writer goes into the five steps. We talk about the sixth step, which is arising in newness of life and being faithful unto death. So we have Romans 10, 17, hear the uh, word of God, because faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Believe in Jesus as the Son of God, John 3, 16. Repent of your sins, Acts 2, 38. Confess your faith in Jesus, Acts 8, 37. They use the Ethiopian eunuch's confession. We can use Peter's confession of faith. Um, be immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins. And this is full immersion. Some of the denominations don't teach full immersion. They teach sprinkling. Mark 16, 16 and 17 um, is one place because Jesus himself teaches baptism. And live faithful unto death, Revelation 2 and verse 10. The second barrier is pride. We've already mentioned pride. Some do not repent because they're proud and stubborn. Luke 18, 9 through 14 is the account of the Pharisee and the tax collector praying side by side. Again, here we have somebody comparing themselves to someone else. The Pharisee said, Lord, don't, don't think of me of like this lowly tax collector over here. But what did the tax collector do? He humbled himself 
He just beat him himself on the chest. Lord, I'm, I'm nobody. But the Pharisee compared himself. He didn't humble himself. Pride goes before destruction. I was corrected earlier. Uh, Proverbs 16, verse 18. Um, so, be less concerned with what others think about you than what God thinks about you. God's um, opinion is more important than what anybody else's is. We shouldn't care what anybody else thinks. The third obstacle is pleasure. Some do not repent because they love a certain sin too much. Proverbs 28, verse 13. He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. See, this is the biggest uh, problem with uh, repentance, is people don't want to forsake that sin. This is where repentance, the definition of it comes in, is turning your back on that sin, forsaking that sin. And people don't want to forsake that sin. And this is why so many people have not repented and come to God. It's because so many love a certain sin way too much and they can't forsake it. That's what drugs and alcohol and And that's why we do have a lot of helps for those things because those are um, addicting and people can get help for that if they need help for that but the thing is don't get into it in the first place. Um, some of that is kind of hard because people get into it because of depression and things like that. But others are led into it for different reasons. So, um, but it's the life of sin that leads people into drugs and alcohol. Um, but we can confess to God, but, uh, oh, okay, we're in the end of the next lesson. I, I turned my phone over here. Did I lose track? Oh, okay. Uh, no. Okay, so uh, we forsake our sins, turn our back on that sin, and if we can't do that, then we haven't truly repented. If we truly love God, we will forsake all for Him, and that includes those sins. Right. We have to be willing to take it. And it's like I usually describe when I uh, teach people. God does have an open hand. It's not a closed fist. He has an open hand. We're standing in it. We can jump out at any time. It's our choice. That's where free will comes in. There's another thing he does with angels.
were talking about with uh, people turning their back on alcohol or uh, on wine or something, they do it for a short period of time. They do it for a certain reason. chapter 26, verses 63 and 66. 
And then the angels proclaim Jesus as the Savior, as the Christ, and as Lord. Luke 2, verses 9 through 14. The Holy Spirit inspired men and taught it, uh, including first century Christians proclaiming it. Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 10, 1 Timothy 6, and other places. And then, who else proclaimed Jesus as the Son of God? Ooh. The demons, right. Uh, Mark 1, Mark 5, and James 2, 14 through 19. Not only did they proclaim it, but they trembled. They trembled. But they didn't act on it. Right. It was not an obedient faith. And that's another false doctrine. People say, all you have to do is believe Jesus is the Son of God. And that's what I always used to say. Well, do you think the demons and the devils want to happen? Well, no. Well, they believe. So, to me, that's a simple, shows it's a simple way to show that's not correct. Exactly. Um, the demons are Satan's workers. They're his servants. And so we know that they're not trustworthy. We know they're not good. And they didn't act on that faith. So we can point to them as ones whose faith is not active in any way. Uh, but they did believe. And not only did they believe, but they believed that he was the Son of God. Making Jesus deity. And so we can point to that. Very good. Uh, let's go to Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. Arlo, could you get those for us, please? Say if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, and shalt believe in thy heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believes in righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made in salvation. Thank you. So, this again is the Bible heart. The first point here he makes a true confession is a public declaration of inner conviction. So it involves the Bible heart, which again is intellect, it is emotion, and it is will. And so it involves the Bible heart and the mouth, as we can read in this verse. It involves thinking, hearing, speaking, and notice it is to be unashamed. Um, Nancy, well, oh, sorry, go ahead. I just want to say the context is he's writing. He is. Uh, and he's not talking about the condition of when they're baptized, he's talking about the continuum. Right. The and the world that believes in Christ. That's, uh, that was one thing I was going to point out with I mean, unto salvation. It is continual. It's invitation sometimes, but it's really out of context for the invitation. This is more about as a Christian walks through life, you continue to believe, you continue to participate. Okay. Um, that's what the word unto salvation is means here is continual, and I was going to point that out later on. Thank you for that. No, you're fine. Uh, Nancy, could you get Romans chapter 1, verse 16 for us, please? And Joseph, while she's getting that, could you turn to Romans chapter 10, verse 11, please? Not just believing because the 
the leaders in the synagogue believed in Jesus. But when it talks about belief and salvation and connection, it's talking about active faith. And James brings that up very clearly in verse 2. So again, this is that showing the fruit. Right, but it is. Sometimes people read that and that's why they think, well, all we have to do is believe. But the word believe, the believing, is going to represent the whole process of being a hopeful Christian and becoming a Christian. Depending on the context. And, and that's the thing, when, when we confess, a lot of times, uh, yeah, like you said, we just, we come up here and we confess at, in front of the witnesses, um, and people think that, okay, that's, that's my fruit. I've, I've overcome uh, my shame and my embarrassment to come up in front of people, but there's more to it than that. We need to produce more fruit, uh, because that's not enough. Um, we have to produce more fruit. John 12, 42 and 43, Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also many believed on him, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, which Earl just pointed that out, lest they should be put out of the synagogues, for they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. Again, we shouldn't care what other people think, we should care what God thinks. So to be accepted by God, we have to have conviction in our confession and show action coupled with that. Uh, so second, a true confession is a recognition of Jesus as the Son of God and the Messiah. So it involves each person truly believing that Jesus is the Son of God, the Messiah, the Christ. Just as Peter's conviction, or confession, sorry, when Jesus asked him and the other disciples, who say ye that I am? And of course, Peter's answer was, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Um, the writer here of um, our lesson, I know what he's trying to say when he writes this, but we have to be careful. He says, salvation rides on what one decides about who Jesus is. But this is an individual answer. When he says salvation rides, it makes it seem like salvation as a whole, um, but it's an individual answer when we confess our faith. And so we have to be careful how we word this. So um, the old saying, there's an old saying that says, God said it, I believe that that settles it. Um, Jesus is the Son of God no matter what, whether we believe it or not. But we have to confess Jesus as the Son of God, each individually, in order for us to be saved. Um, so I would worry that it's not that my salvation rides on what I decide. I decide who Jesus is and whether I accept him. Accept him. Yeah, that's he what I would worry. He is who he is, whether I believe or not. Yeah, that, that, thank you. That's, that's what I was going for. Um, so I, I didn't word it that way, but I like that wording a little better. We have to accept that Jesus is the Son. Lifetime, 
or they do it on Judgment Day, it's going to happen. So he already has authority. He already is the Son of God. It's going to happen. So a true confession is a step on the road to salvation. Romans 10, verse 10, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And, uh, like I said, I was going to point out unto can mean looking forward, but it is also continuing. Uh, it's something, this confession is something that we should continually do, and we're producing those fruits. Uh, but we also have to be, uh, in order to get that salvation, we have to be following God's plan of salvation some man-made confession. Uh, so he goes into the plan of salvation in alphabetical order. We've already looked at the plan of salvation once, and it's a logical, I, I like using the logical order. He does go into that. Uh, but hear, believe, repent, confess, be baptized, and live faithful unto death. Any questions or comments before we get to yes, the questions? Yes, Is not am I as good as 
others, but am I a sinner? Since the answer to that question is yes. The follow-up question is, have I been forgiven of my sins? Yes. We must make our calling and election sure. sure. By comparing what we are taught with Scripture. The gate to heaven is small enough to require up unloading at, sorry, every sin in order to fit. Alright, last one. God likes true confessions. True, as long as we're talking about Bible true confessions. Uh, angels never proclaim Jesus to be the Savior? That's false. Demons refuse to acknowledge that Jesus is the Son of God. That's false. Confessions involves uh, confession involves both heart and mouth. Good. That's true. It is essential to make one's true confession in a large crowd. False. That's false. A confession is not a confession of faith if no one hears it. Good. That's true. People have to hear it in order for it to be a true confession. Because if we're just silent for the rest of our life on this, then it's not a confession. We can't be ashamed. We can't be ashamed, yeah. So, number seven, salvation depends on what one decides about who Jesus is. True. Technically, that's true, but it should the word decide should be accept, I think, there. Um, number eight, Jesus does not have authority over us unless we believe in him. That's false. He does have authority no matter what. The meaning of the word Lord is Savior. <laughs> That's false. It's Master. Yeah. Lord is Master. Yeah. Number 10. The confession of one's faith in Jesus as God's Son is as essential as faith itself. It's true. No one verse contains God's entire plan of salvation. It's true. And we have to look at the entire context. So, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Matthew 3, 13-7. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thy heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Romans 10, 9. For with the Heart, man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made into salvation, Romans 10.10. 10. We believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God, John 6.69. 6, At the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, Philippians 2.10, and that Every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, the glory of God the Father, Philippians 2.11. The true confession God is looking for is the one that Ethiopian treasurer first made years ago. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, Acts 8.37. It is possible to have a confession without conviction. And it is possible to have conviction without confession. The correct order of the steps of salvation is here. Believe, repent, confess, and baptize. Okay. I went too fast for anybody. I have those answers. I can give those out. So. We're not trading anything, so it's all good. All right, thank you for your comments and participation. I appreciate it. Uh, next week, <laughs> not that kind of uh, either. Um, next week, I believe it is five and six, or six and seven, sorry, six and seven, and then we'll do eight by itself. Six and seven.